in uh, alveolar arterial uh, difference of oxygen was all favoring treatment um, importantly. And when the babies did not respond to 20 parts per million of low flow, as you can see, 75% of the control did not respond and only 34% of the treatment group did, did not respond. And there was, a, on the contrary, a much greater response in the treatment group, 51% versus 14% in the control as a total response. Then in those that uh, did not respond uh, to 20 parts per million, then we have that a partial and full response was 14% in the control group and 18% in the treatment group, which tells us that uh, it's, an, it's, it's a random effect and most likely not related to the treatment. And in those that have partial response to 20 parts per million, only one out of the 17 in the treatment has a full response and in the control group, none of them has full response. That's one of the reasons we believe that going from 20 to 80 in general is unlikely to make a benefit to the baby. The other um, analysis that uh, we did um, that is not in the, in, in the full report is what happened to the initial response, uh, thought full response or partial or no response with the final result of uh, reaching ECMO or death. So only uh, the relative risk was 0.4, so 40% roughly of, of improvement in those infants that received nitric oxide versus the control. There was no difference in those with no response or partial response. So we can predict to a certain extent that babies that respond fully to nitric oxide will not reach uh, ECMO or will not die at 20, um, 120 days. This is the main results. And we found in the main results that death or less than 120 days of ECMO was greater in the control group than in the treatment group with a P that was significant. And that was driven mainly by the ECMO number of patients that were greater in the control group than the treatment group. A few years after that one, there were only three studies done. So we did a meta-analysis and looking at uh, ECMO as a final outcome. And the relative risk when you add the three of them is 0.69 with a confidence interval that doesn't cross one and therefore is significant. And things really did not change that much uh, over the years. As you can see here in, 2017, uh, Keith Barrington and Neil Finder did a meta-analysis of inhaled nitric oxide compared with control for respiratory failure in infant born uh, at or near term. There were 17 studies, but he's looking at, looking specifically at those that the intervention was inhaled nitric oxide versus placebo or not treatment. You can see that death or use of ECMO there were eight randomized controlled trials with 859 patients, and the relative risk was 0.66 um, and was significant. So very similar to what we had before in the first three studies. And that was driven, again, by the use of ECMO, in which uh, there were seven trials, 850 patients, and the relative risk was 0.6. Importantly as well, that the only two studies that has a neurodevelopmental disability at 18 to 24 months among survivors, and two randomized trials, the Nino's study among them, with 301 patients, was a similar values. And so there was not deleterious effect in neurodevelopmental outcome in this patient um, at 18 to 20 um, months uh, of age. So I hope that the, this look at the history of inhaled nitric oxide in the context of its use for term and late preterm infants give you an idea of the complexity and importance of the basic research that allows us to treat these infants this way. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for your kind attention and I will be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Professor, uh, for enlightening us the toxic uh, gas once known as a carcinogenic and how it is used 
for the biological role in immunogenicity, neurotransmitter, and vasodilatation. Also, you have highlighted very well on the mechanism of vascular dilatation, vasodilatation, and uh, use of nitric oxide in newborns. You also shown how what is the, how the delivery of nitric oxide can be done, and you have explained the evidence based on the Nino and Sino study as well as the meta analysis. A uh, few questions. First is, is there any window period with the onset of a hypoxic respiratory failure where if, if we use a nitric oxide could be beneficial and after some time is not going to be useful? Second is, is there any role below 34 weeks of gestation? All right. Uh, thanks Thank you very much for the questions. Um, as you can see, that it's been used in adults, but Pepke and Sawa, and that was the first utilization of this one. And it shows that there is a benefit, of course, because of those patients were uh, uh, with pulmonary hypertension for a chronic time. Uh, the effect was only while the baby, the, while the patient was in nitric oxide, and uh, the the pulmonary hypertension of the newborn baby is different than that in adults, and therefore. In newborn babies, I think the effects would be beneficial uh, because it, it is usually a, a disease that, in general, is is uh, reversible. So, uh, newborn babies, I think, is is very useful, and I don't see any time differences in, in when you treat it in the NICU unit. And beyond that, I can not tell you, but I would imagine that when the patient has gone into a survivor a disease, then the, the reversibility of that one will not be, uh, the, the nitric oxide will not be effective or need to be continuous. In regards to the using the um, premature babies, um, it, it is very interesting because there are two, 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 two things that are important. One has been used for the prevention of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And as, as you know, Dr. Ballard is one of the studies that were done and it did not really show a beneficial effect for that purpose. Uh, but in regards to a uh, premature baby, one of the things that I think is very important is, um, and we did a study in animals, in rabbits actually, and that was presented in the SPR in 1993, 1994, I believe, um, in which we use rabbits in, and we maintain, we produce a, by Lachman technique, a wash, washing of the lungs and then creating that uh, model, then we, we <clears throat> produce, uh, give nitric oxide into them, but uh, maintaining good uh, lung expansion, we maintain good gases. And by doing so, we were increasing the FRC <clears throat> despite of the surfactant deficiency. In the same um, um, past uh, uh, meeting, there was a study by Maureen in which they used ships and they did um, in these lamps um, have the same kind of approach, but when they were born earlier, that there was the that was the the way they did it. Instead of 146 days, they delivered them earlier. That produced a severe RDS. They maintained the same ventilatory settings, and those uh, lamps did not respond to nitric oxide, which tells you that the importance of the maintaining the FRC is essential basically for the nitric oxide to be used. So when we use that in premature babies, we need to be careful to really have a good FRC before we initiate nitric oxide. Because if we initiate nitric oxide before that one, it may not be successful, number one. And if um, you use it, then um, <clears throat> it's not gonna be beneficial until you have a good FRC. So I believe that is uh, there is a role for that one in premature babies, but you have to be careful as well not to change the um, hemodynamics in, in a too fast way because you might create problems in terms of uh, blood flow into the brain uh, that might lead to uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Looks to be uh, uh, no questions from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, we thank you uh, on behalf of the organizers uh, spending your valuable time. Mostly it is a very early morning. 
and enlightening us on this topic of anal nitric oxide with evidence base. Thank you, Professor Carlos. It was, it was my pleasure and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Moratti, for your kind presence. Uh, it's so nice of you to join us again. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Leslie Lewis for moderating the session. Thank you, sir, for joining again. Sorry, sorry, Carlos. Now, uh, we have the last session coming up. This is a session, uh, the most important session as well as uh, hemodynamic discussion is concerned. Today was devoted to neonatal hemodynamics. And this is on what is the ideal anotrope? Uh, is it a myth or a reality? To discuss this very complex topic, we have an expert in the field whose algorithm on functional echo is the hit these days. A good friend of mine, Amish Jain. To moderate this session, I have again great honor to call a good friend of mine, Dr. Rahul Yadav from Chennai. So this is the last session of the conference. All other halls are finished. And after this session, we wind up with a validatory function. Hi, Amish. Are you there? Yes. Hi. Hi, Maharaj. Can you hear me? Yeah. Let's put it on. We can hear you. Thank you for joining. No, thank you so much for inviting me. 6 a.m.? <laughs> yes, it's 6.30. <laughs> okay, okay. Fine, fine. So, uh, over to Dr. Rahul. Thank you, sir. This topic is close to everybody's heart about inotropes. So welcome Dr. Amish Jain to enlighten us about uh, this inotrope dilemma. And uh, a, lot, a lot of confusions actually exist in everybody's mind about the use of inotrope, misuse, disuse, and all those things. So I'm looking forward to a great session. Please welcome. Can I share my slides now? Yes, yes, you are visible. Okay. Nice up, visible. Okay. Awesome. All right. So uh, once again, thank you so much for, for inviting me and, and uh, being flexible enough for the timing that I could get another hour of sleep before I have to do this. Um, and I know everybody is very keen and, and, and interested in knowing about the anotropes and, and, and neonates, and you sort of talked it up so much that I hope I hope at the end of it, um, people don't feel let down by me. <laughs> so uh, before I start, I like to sort of uh, share my disclosures. Um, I do hold an industry grant for an investigator initiated research project uh, for uh, for inhaled nitric oxide use in prenatal infants across Canada. So we create we uh, we're creating a registry there in Canada, and I've taken sponsorships for symposiums as well as for uh, conducting webinars and conferences from both Malankar Pharmaceuticals as well as Medical Informatics. Um, these disclosures have nothing to do with the anotropes or hypertension is what I'm talking about, but uh, there it is. All right. So when when uh, Manoj first shared this topic to me um, some time ago and, uh, and invited me for this conference, I actually thought it was a beautiful topic as everybody is, is sort of talking about. I was like, this will be very fun to prepare. Uh, but this is how I looked when I started preparing this presentation. Um, I looked at the topic for, for numerous hours and I don't know exactly what to talk about because there's not a lot of evidence out there to, what, uh, to answer this question particularly. So with that said, I started examining the question again. So just have a look at the question. The question was, is there an ideal anotrope for neonate? So what does this question has? It has the patient, which is our uh, patient population neonate. It has the treatment, which is the inotrope. But what's missing? something is missing to link the treatment with the patient. So, but this question is a reality, right? All of us in our practices are, are constantly asking this question, but is it, is it a valid question to ask whether there's an ideal anotrope for neonate? Let's examine that. And that's probably where I would really like to hone in and get everybody's attention that what, what how, how else can we ask this question? And if we ask this question in a different way, then perhaps it will no longer be a myth um, and, and, and be, our, be our own uh, reality. So a little bit about the history. Where is this question coming from? 
Um, it really is this paper in 1992 from the British Perinatal Association, a expert consensus group was set up um, and they basically noted that there is very little data on management of blood pressure or even the normal range at that time. But at that time, as a, as a working group, they thought that a mean arterial blood pressure in a newborn and in a, in a preterm neonate equivalent to gestational age in weeks appears to be okay for a minimum value. And that's not, that's not wrong. If you read this paper in detail, uh, they basically are, are very, very cautious about everything. Um, and, and even in real practice after that, the normal ranges were set up. The actual mean value from a centile chart point of view, if you look at the third centiles on those values, it's not very far away from the mean gestational age, uh, more or less one or two difference. Um, so they, they were not exactly wrong. Um, but, and they also graded the evidence quite low, which was sort of uh, category C. But what translated that is that after that, that sort of became our, uh, our, our, our main guide for clinical practice uh, when we started using anotrope. And then in 2003, this, this uh, review article was published, um, which basically highlighted how we were treating um, hypotension um, in, in very low birth weight infants. Um, and this was sort of a, almost like a cookbook recipe that we started with. We'll give volume expansion, we'll give dopamine, then we'll give dobitamine. And after that, we'll give steroid. Um, and then uh, to be honest, during my training in UK, which started in 2004, this is exactly what I did uh, for, the, for the first four years. Um, didn't think it worked very well, but, but uh, all my hypertension were just managed in this way. Uh, that the reason hypertension was important was because there were numerous papers that it actually associated with the adverse outcome in, in, in uh, low birth weight infants in the first 24 hours life. And that association remained true till today. So this is a paper from 2015 we have a very large cohort of, uh, of very low birth weight infants um, in, in, um, in UK, where they examined the lowest mean arterial pressure in the first day of life um, and, and, and associated that with outcomes. And they did find that hypertension in the first 24 hours of life is associated with, uh, continues to be associated with adverse outcome, which included IVH, BPD, or mortality. So again, full uh, confirming that uh, it, till today, the hypertension is not a good thing. But interestingly, very next year, in the same journal and archives, another paper was published, again a large study, where they examined the relationship between hypertension and hypertension's treatment and outcome, um, and, and, what, and adjusted their analysis for the exact BP number, which was there when the treatment was initiated. And what they found interestingly was that independent of the blood pressure changes, the anti-hypertensive therapy exposure itself was associated with increased risk of death or, or disability but a composite, when you look, separate them out, then the association wasn't, wasn't there. Um, so again, the hypertension is associated with adverse outcome, hypertension's treatment is associated with adverse outcome. So where do we go with this? We have a hypertensive baby, how do we translate these two papers or this type of studies into clinical practice, right? That, that always remains the question. Uh, in 2007, our good friend, uh, um, Gene Dempsey, um, and with, with Keith Barrington published a meta-analysis um, of hypertension treatment in preterm infants and couldn't find any, any theme. Having said that, the studies were all small, as you probably all know. Um, there hasn't been a large enough study which is properly powered in treatment of hypertension in, in preterm or term infant for that matter. But what they concluded from this meta-analysis was that there's a, there's a distinct lack of prospective research in this issue. But also it is possible that a simple BP threshold, which all of us are, are looking for, uh, where a treatment indication is required may not even exist, right? So, and, and this, this, uh, these data or this conclusion hasn't changed till yet. Till now we are confused. Should we be treating a patient with a preterm infant um, who appears to have hypertension um, and when and with what? But one thing is clear, this uh, cookbook therapy doesn't work. We have tried this for years and it just does not improve our outcomes, uh, what we are looking for. So, Let's go back to the basics for a minute. When we don't have evidence, what we have is physiology. And we, we want to re-examine what we have been doing, how we have been doing. Um, is it that the treatment doesn't exist or is it we've been going about it in the wrong way? Um, what is our clinical goal? So our clinical goal is to optimize oxygen delivery, to improve or preserve organ performance and patient outcome. Really, I'm, I'm sure everybody will agree when we are treating blood uh, hypertension in, in neonates or in anybody for that matter. That's the goal. And then to achieve that goal, what we are trying to treat really is shock or low flow states, or perhaps hypertension, even with the, in the absence of shock to basically optimize organ perfusion. So let's look at those two states and what are the variables at play? Um, just I'm just gonna spend five, 10 minutes in, in trying to 
sort of get everybody attention of how many things are there which are involved in shock or hypertension so let's look about shock first what do we what do we really mean by low flow state what we mean is that the it's a state where the blood flow to the organ is insufficient to meet his oxygen demand now uh, here in the in the schematic it is showing can oxygen consumption and delivery are, are are a balance uh, a fine balance actually it's not body always work on surplus that's why our mixed venous saturations are 60 to 80% that is 20 to 30% tissue extraction so our body always gives more than the tissue needs not exactly the same um, and it is that delivery of oxygen is what as clinicians or as critical care clinicians we are trying to maintain we can't do much about tissue extraction but we certainly can diagnose a lower delivery and quickly fix it to optimize delivery that's the goal and that's what we are using anotropes for so if you look at the delivery of oxygen dio2 it actually is a product of cardiac output per minute which is the amount of blood coming from the heart and the actual content of oxygen in the in the circulating blood which is co2 the co2 is dependent upon hemoglobin and oxygen saturations so that gives us three uh, potential targets to look for when we are optimizing oxygen delivery the cardiac output the hemoglobin and arterial saturations now arterial saturation hemoglobin are easy to measure we constantly try to optimize them uh, but then the focus that's why i'm going to focus mainly on cardiac output what about cardiac output well the cardiac output is as everybody knows here is a product of stroke volume and heart rate so if you are tachycard if you are tachycardic you want to have higher cardiac output up to a point till the filling gets compromised and then if you are uh, your stroke volume is each the amount of blood coming out at each stroke or each cardiac uh, sort of each uh, pumping of the heart now the stroke volume itself depend upon three factors is the preload which is the volume of blood present in the ventricle at end diastole it's afterload that's the resistance against which the ventricle must contract and its contractility itself the net result of these three forces working together determines stroke volume which we can sort of loosely call cardiac function so when we are trying to optimize stroke volume we are thinking about preload afterload and contractility so in summary if you look at the, the schematic the the cardiac output or the target oxygen blood flow which will eventually determine cellular metabolism or at least optimize the conditions for cellular metabolism uh, depends upon the content of oxygen where we can talk about oxygen saturations that is lung disease cardiac shunts hemoglobin um, and cardiac output itself determines about afterload so we want to think about uh, systemic vascular resistance vasopressors you could have a left ventricle hypertrophy which is obstructing the 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 flow preload how is the hydration status is diastolic function optimal is there effusion is there high mean airway pressure which is causing reduction in preload contractility and heart rate right so these are the variables that we want to play with the blood pressure itself which is what we are trying to measure is a product of systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output it directly itself is a surrogate of cellular metabolism or optimizing cellular metabolism but doesn't directly itself play a role it plays a role through systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output and through all these factors together now the blood pressure itself has three components as we all know systolic diastolic mean now our focus usually remains on mean because that's where our monitors start beeping but really mean blood pressure what i used to normally say is mean is screen so trying to figure out where that low mean is coming from we now know that the systolic blood pressure is more reflective of the cardiac output or actually stroke volume to be precise while the diastolic blood pressure is more reflective of the systemic vascular resistance and and together uh, they produce the mean and diastolic blood pressure plays a bigger role in dropping your mean than systolic does simply by the formula that the mean is calculated from so when we are looking at blood pressure we're going to think about diastolic or systolic is it when we talk about hypotension and not just mean and that might give us a clue where the problem lies now this is a uh, chart straight from the sort of medical textbooks that i have um, adapted towards neonate in, in terms of shock so which type of shock are we treating is it hypovolemic shock is it distributive shock in our patient population is largely from sepsis not so much neurogenic is it cardiogenic shock uh, or is it obstructive shock now the the red arrows indicate the primary problem which these shock are from and the others are as either a, a downstream effect or an adaptation of the body so the hypovolemic shock is basically extremely low preload and treatment largely remains in the, in 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 fluid therapy and and the patient may have high svr as a as a as a compensatory mechanism distributive shock which is sepsis for example is typically a, a low svr state we still give some fluid but the treatment really is is trying to correct the the vasodilatation that we are seeing 
cardiogenic shock, the problem is cardiac output and function, while in obstructive shock, which is a very unique sort of um, uh, situation where the problem is preload, but only of the right ventricle. And, and, and then from there onwards, the downstream effect starts. So it's important to categorize what exactly are we treating, right? which type of shock are we treating. And from there, we can sort of gauge what type of treatment we need to be testing. Now, the shock itself in the septic shock, for example, can be a cold shock or a warm shock state. A cold shock, basically, as everybody knows, comes from a high adrenergic response to the, to the uh, circulating uh, sort of um, uh, toxins, which causes uh, vasoconstriction of the, of the peripheries as well as cardiac dysfunction. And from there, the blood pressure might actually remain normal or even high sometimes, but in the presence of poor perfusion and low oxygen delivery. The warm shock, on the other hand, is a, is a profound vasodilatory state where it's a profound vasodilatation, brisk uh, uh, or normal capillary refill time and bounding pulses where the preload or coming back to the left ventricle or to the right side is low because of vasodilatation. And then you have uh, you, you develop uh, shock uh, or, or poor, uh, poor oxygen delivery from that. So these are all the variables that are at play. So with this in mind, let's revise the question. What was I, what I actually felt, what was missing in this question? What we really should be asking is, is there an ideal anotrope for neonates to treat what? Not just patient and treatment, but disease was missing. So let's define the disease, define the state that we are trying to uh, test for or the context, and then ask the question, is there an ideal anotrope to treat neonates with transitional hypertension? Is there an ideal anonate to treat, treat patients, uh, hypertensive neonates with septic shock, for example? Um, and then we perhaps it may, may uh, allow us to do a more meaningful investigations. So what are our options here? We have two options in my view. One, we define the specific phenotype or pathophysiology which we are examining ahead of time by, doing, by conducting physiological studies or wherever is appropriate, we establish a predominant phenotype of the specific diseases and then utilize the disease as a, as a surrogate of physiology to try and test our treatments. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples of that. For uh, Now, starting with transitional hypertension. Now, this is a topic which is very close to the heart of all the neonatologists, including myself, because we see it often enough in preterm infants and we don't really know what to do with it. So, um, sort of some time ago, um, a, a number of um, our friends, um, Alan Groves in this instance, as well as other studies from, uh, from Martin Skidmore and, and, and Nick Evans actually examined this question physiologically using functional echocardiography. Uh, what is the relationship between blood flow um, and, and, and uh, blood pressure in preterm infants? And, and uh, in this relatively large and quite tedious study, uh, uh, Dr. Groves found that the low blood pressure had no correlation at all with poor perfusion in the first 48 hours of life in, in sick preterm infants. He measured flows in, in uh, coming out of the left side, right side, descending aorta, as well as SVC flow. And all he found was a very weak but positive uh, inverse correlation uh, between SVC flow and blood pressure, but only in the first six hours of age. After that, there was absolutely no correlation whatsoever. So he concluded from that that, <coughs> that blood pressure in preterm infants does not really tell us what's happening in the, from, a, from a surrogates of flow state um, from an echo. There's another very interesting study, uh, small uh, physiological study pub, uh, published in Neonatology in 2009, where they examine the levels of catecholamines um, in hypertensive uh, low birth weight infant in the first 24 hours of life. And what they found was they only had 22 patients, but they divide them into mild hypertension and severe hypertension and compared, their, compared the, the, the levels of catecholamines um, in, in their blood. And what they found was that the patients who have, have severe hypertension had a higher uh, levels or higher plasma dopamine levels and lower levels of norepinephrine to dopamine ratio. Now that's important because dopamine gets converted to norepinephrine in periphery. Uh, and I'm talking about endogenous dopamine and norepinephrine. So what they concluded was that the physiology determining severe hypertension in extremely low birth, birth weight infants may be a decreased conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine. Now, that begs the question, when we start treating these patients with dopamine, what exactly are we doing? Is that the right treatment? Um, not to mention, uh, before I go into the next one, uh, uh, not to mention that uh, there are now two studies demonstrating that dopamine use in the first 24 hours of life actually um, disturbs the cerebral autoregulation in, in, uh, in preterm infants. So again, which is quite important from an IVH prevention perspective. 
So we also examined the same question in our, in our uh, study cohort recently, where we did a study looking at the physiology to define the physiology of transitional hypertension in extremely preterm infants. <laughs> we conducted a match case control study of neonates less than 28 weeks gestational age over a six year period. And we basically utilize our ECHO database um, because many instances when, when, we are in, when we are in house, if a patient develop hypertension, um, we would be scanning them first to determine their physiology uh, and, and, and before any treatment was put on. And that was a missing link in literature because all the studies done so far were not pre-treatment. So then your, your echocardiographic variables are affected uh, by the treatment on board. So we were able to find, um, despite having a very huge database, we were able to only find 14 patients in whom a, a comprehensive uh, uh, echocardiogram uh, was actually performed prior to any treatment was given. <coughs> in otherwise well infant with transitional hypertension. So we define transitional hypertension here as a mean blood pressure less than gestational age for over an hour in otherwise well babies. These are not patients who have early onset sepsis. These are uh, uh, appearing uh, healthy appearing preterm infants who are on a low oxygen requirement, less than 40% for the study and do not have sepsis. And then we match these, uh, these uh, uh, hypertensive patients with normotensive controls, uh, two is to one. And you can see here their baseline characteristics were actually similar, there was no difference. Um, in this result section, you can see that the systolic, diastolic, and mean BP of the hypertensive group was indeed quite low compared to the normotensive infant, which is exactly what we wanted. When we compared the echocardiographic finding in these patients, uh, we were a little bit surprised because we were hoping that we were thinking that we were going to find <coughs> low cardiac output state, but that wasn't the case. As you can see here, their cardiac output was exactly similar uh, to two controls, and their left ventricular function actually was higher in compensation rather than lower. What they did have was a large PDA. So basically it was a large PDA, which was more left to right in the first day of life, which was uh, determining hypertension in these re relatively well elegans. And so we concluded basically, and this is exactly what our clinical experience have been, um, that in, in relatively healthy, um, low birth weight infants, a low blood pressure in otherwise well babies is, is associated with low systemic vascular resistance state and large PDA and not ventricular dysfunction. So in my practice, for example, in the, in the years I've been working, I've almost never had to use inotrope in the first day of life in an otherwise well-appearing baby. Because each time we scan them, all they have is a large PDA. So either, and, and it's, tran it's transient. So we just manage the PG PDA shunt and the blood pressure usually becomes normalized. <coughs> so if I randomize these patients into, say, dopamine versus norepi or dobutamine versus dopamine, or I treat them with that escalating uh, treatment chart that we saw, I'm not entirely sure I'm going to do them any, any good. So is, to me, it's not that of a surprise that we don't really are able to find improvement in outcome with treatment because perhaps we are treating it the wrong way. We haven't determined their physiology yet. Uh, what about hypertension in sepsis and neck? This is another very common uh, uh, sort of state where we are using inotropes for. Um, and now there have been three or four different studies. I'm just pointing one of them out from, from Nick Evans and Kurt Deval. And all of them have demonstrated that in preterm infants, the predominant phenotype in sepsis or neck is actually high output, low SVR state. There are occasions of cardiac dysfunction too, but they're very few and far between. And cold shock is also extremely uncommon, although it does happen occasionally. And in my experience, whenever it happens, it only happens for a transient state before changing the phenotype back to a uh, visitality state. So this is one condition where we could uh, use the disease as a surrogate of physiology that now that has been established and actually say that we want to test the treatment of, of hypertension in sepsis or neck with two different vasopressors, exactly as it happened in adult critical care. So we asked, uh, recently asked this question in our uh, clinical practice the, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, the dopamine use in these patients were used to be predominant before has gradually changed over to norepinephrine, rightly or wrongly. Um, so what we did was recently we conducted a, a retrospective chart review for the last 10 years, um, and we found 156 neonates who were preterm and had sepsis or neck and needed treatment for at least four hours. And their first line therapy was <coughs> dopamine for 113 patients and 43 in, in norepinephrine patients. So we basically um, uh, compared their uh, clinical outcomes after using propensity score to match uh, to, uh, to, adjust for, uh, to adjust their baseline variables. And we looked at outcomes such as seven day mortality and pre discharge cell mortality, new IVH, which is really is what we uh, most relevant uh, sort of um, uh, uh, morbidities 
in, in, in this patient population. We compared their baseline characteristic, there was no difference at all, except the norepinephrine group had a higher magnesium sulfate uh, utilization, which was not surprising because norepinephrine group was a little bit, uh, <coughs> sorry, was a more recent than the dopamine group. Uh, when we looked at their pre-treatment illness severity, so these are the markers present before treatment was initiated. The norepinephrine group actually had higher respiratory needs, so their mean artery, uh, airway pressure, their maximum heart rate, their FiO2 was higher than the dopamine group, so they're a little bit more sicker from a respiratory standpoint. Um, but apart from that, there was no other difference. Um, of note, the uh, use of hydrocortisone was similar in both groups. But when we looked at their outcomes, what we found is that once we adjusted them, them using, uh, using propensity scores, the mortality in the norepinephrine group was actually lower, uh, both seven-day mortality as well as pre-discharge mortality. In addition, new uh, diagnosis of neck or, or, or bacteremia subsequent, so after the episode during the rest of the NICU stay, was also lower in the norepinephrine group as well as the severe grade IVH um, in, the, in the survivors. So it appeared from this study that norepinephrine um, is appears to be a better um, a presser uh, for treatment of sepsis or uh, hyp um, neck associated hypertension in, in preterm infants than, uh, than, than dopamine. However, this is a retrospective study um, and uh, obviously there's a, there is a, uh, also interaction with time because norepinephrine group is more recent. So it's always possible that what we are looking for a better outcome is basically reflection of better outcome overalls in, in more recent time. So, but this is a start. Now, motivated by this particular study, we are right now conducting a large uh, national uh, comparative effectiveness research, which is prospective, uh, where we are comparing the use of dopamine versus norepinephrine uh, for hypertension in very, uh, in very preterm infants. This study will be running over the next four years and uh, across 18 sites in Canada. Um, and and uh, as it turns out, not surprising, um, half of the Canada was using dopamine and half is using norepinephrine at this time point, which is what we are utilizing to, to, ma to make a comparison. So hopefully in, 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 the, in due course, we'll have some results um, in how to manage hypertension in, in, in sepsis at least. Next, I'll come to the role of echocardiography. Why do we use echocardiography or functional echocardiography a lot in this, in this patient population? Because it gives us the physiology. It tells us those variables that we are worried about um, and, and it sort of guides us where to go in terms of our treatment. It provides us with a qualitative assessment of preload. There is no real marker quantitatively, but we can just overall see filling. Um, it provides us with both qualitative and quantitative measure of contractility. It tells us what the stroke output uh, or, or, or stroke volume and cardiac output is at that time. And it gives us a surrogate to appraise whether this is a low systemic vascular resistance state, that is total peripheral resistance or high. And, and that comes from this simple formula. The mean BP is cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So if we have mean BP from the, from the bedside already, we can calculate cardiac output. Then we can make a judgment whether this is a, uh, a total peripheral resistance is high or low. For example, if you have a low BP, but the echo shows that the cardiac output is high, then it has to be low total peripheral resistance. And that's what we start chasing then. Then we start chasing the resistance, uh, fixing the SVR. On the other hand, if the cardiac output is low and the BP is normal, then you know it's a high SVR state, um, which is basically consistent with cold shock. So that's where we use echo a lot in, in determining it. Um, recently at our centers, in Toronto, we asked the question whether using functional echo uh, or, or TNE consults, we call it, um, makes any difference. Um, so again, we went back for the last 10 years, we got all the patients who had critical illness in our, in our, uh, in our two centers um, and critical illness we defined as treatment with inotropes or inhaled nitric oxide. And then we divided them whether a TNE was done as a part of the management uh, uh, or not within 24 hours. And we had two cohorts. So a relatively large study with 430 patients, 250 were managed without using echo and 150, 160 were managed with echo, which is a TNE. Um, and as you can see here, whenever a TNE consultation was utilized as a part of the management uh, to try and uh, sort of tighten the management, the, the incidence of the, the adjusted odds ratio for death within seven days of illness or death before discharge were low compared to those patients who were managed without TNE. When we looked at patients only needing anotrope, that is, these are the patients which we're talking about today, where uh, there was uh, there were there is basically hemodynamic compromise alone. Um, that's where the majority of mortality was seen, uh, improvement in mortality was seen. So you can see the death within seven days was much lower, 
in hypotensive patients in whom echocardiography was used to define the physiology and and manage and guide treatment versus not again pointing to the same things that clinically it is really hard to know uh, which physiology we are treating and then the management becomes a little bit more regimental and protocolized on the other hand if you are able to understand <coughs> what physiology you are uh, aiming at you can change your treatment accordingly and that seems to benefit um, so that opens up the question that is it possible to do it say so maybe a uh, uh, randomized controlled trial of utilizing echocardiography um, in management of these patients and define physiology prior to randomizing them to treatments uh, and we are currently sort of having a, in discussion about how to um, how to operationalize that or if it is obviously the problem is feasibility and and, and the amount of workload that comes with it but nevertheless it, it highlights the importance of defining physiology again so is there an ideal anatrope to treat neonates with a particular disease state in my opinion it's not a myth but it is also not a reality just yet i think we are beginning to be smart about it we're beginning to learn how best to find or or tighter our treatments and based on that studies are now big, started to come through or beginning to happen where we are going to be able to generate the evidence we are looking for comparing two similar acting drugs for uh, for uh, for um, for managing the phys for managing a common pathophysiology um rather than a a a random selection of two anatropes so i'm going to end my presentation with this quote from albert einstein which actually is very apt to our uh, patient population he said that if i had only one hour to save the world i would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only 5 minutes finding the solution till now we have spent most of our time in trying to find the solution and haven't really spent enough time to define the problem and i think that's changing um and 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 as that changes i believe we will find we will be able to define the problem better and able to find the solution and able to answer this question uh, which is the best and hopefully with that the variability in practice will go down um i'm going to end by acknowledging all my past mentors and guides who have worked with and and many trainees and and the funding agencies that have supported my work till date with that i've come to the end of my lecture and thank you for your attention and i hope i've been able to do exactly like this when i don't know the answer to exam question i have refused to leave it blank i've just filled it up with things that i can uh, plug the holes with thank you thank you very much it was a great talk actually the way in which you explain the knowns and unknowns and past and future was quite excellent you frankly admitted some things at the same time gave us hope that after completion of this study and in 2027 i think we'll be more on track as far as not adrenaline versus dopamine is concerned but uh, uh, in any question from audience we we'll, we we'll welcome questions because this is our last session yeah please uh hello dr amish this is kavita from goa uh, uh so i had three questions one is uh, in all the algorithms they mentioned please please uh, there were three questions happen no the speakers get confused okay last one but they uh, please ask one question after that you can ask okay. after second question uh, one question at a time in in all the algorithms they they mention which drug to to go to next but they don't mention what is the time frame that we need to wait before we hike up the dose or we skip uh, we go to the next drug so what is the ideal time we wait to see how the patient improves and when do we hike up the dose so now that's an excellent question thank you kavita for bringing it up <clears throat> there are two aspects to this um, one aspect is has the patient received the treatment yet and the reason i say this is because i've seen it numerous time we start the treatment on the pump there is a pick line or a uvc or a central line in place and the our infusion rates are very slow so it takes some time an hour and a half for the actual drug to reach the circulation so that's the one thing to think about when we are thinking about whether the patient has responded or not so in our center we have come up with strategies to try to run the infusion a bit faster in the beginning so that the dead space in the catheter is comp is 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 uh, uh, sort of uh, taken care of very sh in a short amount of time but if you don't <coughs> if you are running an infusion at 0.1 ml an hour or 0.2 ml an hour and your entire pick line has like say 0.3 ml that might take one and a half hours so that's the one thing so when you're making that decision the second thing to important of note is how quickly if the patient has already received the treatment is still hypotension how fast you increase um and i think the answer relies on physiology again and actually pharmacology what is the half life of these drugs so the catecholamines have a very short half life is about 2 minutes so if you multiply them by 5 by 5 you're talking about 10 minutes so if you look at the adult trials 
of uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine, they increase the, the, the dose every 10 to 15 minutes, right? And that exactly is what we tend to do in our practice as well. In, in, uh, because once the patient has received, say, a particular dose of dopamine for 10 minutes, the effect is there. There's nothing is going to change after that. So waiting any longer doesn't really make any sense because pharmacologically, the drug has already worked whatever dose you're giving. So um, when it comes to using drugs like uh, uh, milrinone, it's a little bit unknown because uh, milrinone is a slow acting drug. It takes time. So our mean time uh, to know whether the drug has worked or not or how much is usually about three to four hours from the two pharmacokinetic studies that we have done in preterm infants particularly uh, and one in term infants. Um, and we get the data from, car from uh, post-cardiac surgery uh, term newborn newborns. The pharmacokinetic data suggests that every three to four hours, you can you know exactly. Um, vasopressin is similar. It's very short acting. Once you've given it, 15 minutes is more than enough to know whether actually it has worked or not, and then escalate the dose. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Uh, so my second question, in the, in the scenario of extremely low gestational age, you said the first 24 hours, suppose we have a baby whose BPs are normal, but the CRT is borderline. Four seconds, three seconds. So, would you would you still wait, or the BPs are normal and kind of stable? I, uh, as, as I was saying, define the physiology. Why is the cap refill time high? So, if your if your cap refill time is is prolonged um, and the blood pressures are normal, that patient most likely have a vasoconstricted state. There is no other way to actually have that, right? So um, if if your cap refill time is a true in marker, a true indicator of uh, of flow, which is what we're using sur is a surrogate for. So in our practice, we wouldn't treat based on, I mean, at least when I say we, I mean, most of us um, or many of us, not most of us, will actually end up examining all the variables to try and define the problem. So cap refill time, urine output, serum lactate, uh, and now we use uh, NEARS quite a lot to try to see, uh, and we put them together as a marker of end organ performance. So the baby's passing urine, is lactate low, is there acidosis, if the, if the nears is, is in normal range, if those those four or five categories are, 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 are making sense, um, then perhaps the patient is not in shock. And then it's, it's, a, it's a matter of one symptom. And then we'll define where it's coming from. Um, in those scenarios, we might wait if everything is okay. But majority of time, the, what you're defining, the cap refill time is prolonged. You, other parameters will not be normal because cap refill time in, in preterm infant particularly, it's a late sign. Uh, they will often have low, low uh, flow state. They will be in shock, but cap refill time will be okay. Um, and once that goes down, it becomes four or five seconds. Um, usually, they are in shock for, for the most part. So no, I, I would treat it. I have treated patients with a high blood pressure or normal blood pressure with the hypotension, with the shock, uh, with vasodilatory agent, because that's their problem. Their problem is cardiac dysfunction or low dose epinephrine uh, to improve their cardiac output. Yes, thank you. And my last one. So why are we comparing dopamine with, uh, with uh, norepinephrine? Why aren't we comparing dopamine with epinephrine for septic shock? <laughs> right. So... Um, Again, comes down to physiology, right? So in, in it's very interesting. In, in adults, the studies have clearly demonstrated that their predominant physiology is vasodilatory shock. Uh, because of that, the adult uh, colleagues in 2008 or 9 actually did retrospective study just like we just did and found that found different results. One study said dopamine was better. One study said norepinephrine were better. But those are the two drugs that was predominantly used in adult medicine. And then after that, they did randomized controlled trials um, and then subsequent meta-analysis which proved that norepinephrine was better than dopamine in patient outcomes. Uh, and, and not just that, their splanchnic uh, circulation was actually better uh, with norepinephrine than dopamine uh, because dopamine increases the flow, but also increases consumption in the GI tract. Because of which the, sep the surviving sepsis guidelines actually clearly defines norepinephrine as a primary vasopressor in adult. Now, there is no data for neonates. Um, there is some data for pediatrics. Pediatric is different. When you look at the physiological studies in children, their predominant phenotype in shock is cold shock. And cardiac dysfunction is more common, which is where epinephrine came from. Uh, so they don't, uh, so that's why the, the recommendation for children is either use, norepinef uh, use epinephrine or nor norepinephrine. If you look at the surviving sepsis gui guideline and over dopamine, but they give it a very weak recommendation. And that's because um, the data is not there. There are only two small pilot studies in children and they basically use expert consensus and translating adult. 
the preterm phenotype is different. The term babies, and it's very, very interesting because it, I think it's developmentally regulated. The term babies have a septic shock that we oftentimes see with early onset sepsis, for example. Their phenotype is also like children. They are more likely to be in cold shock at beginning. But the preterm is predominantly vasodilatory shock. So preterm actually uh, phenotype is very similar to, to adult phenotype. So, which is why the predominant use, um, we use pressors rather than a positive inotrope. You certainly can test epinephrine too, but it has to be on a higher dose, not beta dose. It has to be alpha dose to so actually get vasopressor effect. Um, and um, why we are comparing norepinephrine versus dopamine? Because those were the two studies. So we did a survey of Canadian uh, NICUs and we found that out of uh, 18 NICUs, eight were using dopamine, seven were using norepinephrine and only two were using epinephrine. There were actually units and I know unit that use epinephrine as, as, as a first on. So the fact that the, we can only test the therapies that are actually currently in use and completely different um, because that's the, what people were using. So the first question is that. So if we, if we find that more people were using epinephrine as primary, we would have compared that too. Any question from audience? So it was a very nice uh, lecture, this one. I, I just want to know about one thing. Uh, many times there is now uh, some debate going on whether steroids should be a rescue or steroids should be earlier than inotrope because the proponents of both uh, seem logically correct. So what is your take on that? Uh, I agree. Uh, that's again an, uh, an unknown entity in our patient population. So I can tell you that I've, having spoken to almost 40 different units trying to organize the study, um, I came across at least three or four which actually uses uh, or uh, use hydrocortisone as immediately as the hypotension start, but they still do use the anotrope, but they also start hydrocort immediately after that. And that because it takes some time for hydrocortisone to actually work. Um, and the, everybody else were using hydrocortisone as second line agent after the first line agent fails. Um, in the past, we used to use it after failure of two drugs, uh, but that's changed. In our, in our unit also, if the first drug doesn't work, people will just throw in hydrocortisone. Um, my take is very uh, is is that hydrocortisone, no matter who you give it to, will increase blood pressure hundred uh, percent. It always will, even if you and I take it in the in without being septic, our blood pressure will go up. It always does. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We don't know. It certainly solves the problem at the bedside. So at two o'clock in the morning, when I have hypotensive patient, and my first treatment is failed, or uh, even before that, if I put hydrocortisone in, I know the blood pressure is going to go up three, four hours later. Um, and and uh, so I think going to hydrocortisone is, is understandable to solve the hypotension problem. But are we doing any good to these patients? We don't really know. Um, I would say it is fair. Uh, so what are, we tend to do in our practice is uh, we tend to do their cortisol level at baseline. Um, and, and patients who have low cortisol, despite being the stress of hypotension, we have a low threshold to start hydrocortisone. If the patient demonstrated a, a cortisol level of say 500 already, we don't give them hydrocortisone on top. Um, that, that's, that's our practice as far as physiology is concerned, whether it's good or bad, we don't know. Again, we need, we need data to understand. Um, there are two small studies from hydrocortisone use, uh, the unit that use a lot, um, and they did a similar to us, did a retrospective study comparing past and present and actually found no improvement in outcome, but they were very small. They're not uh, sort of uh, targeted for that. But I think I think that's a valid question to ask. Um, I would encourage people to define whether the patient actually has a low uh, a low endogenous um, steroid response to stress before supporting them with the with hydrocortisone rather than putting it on everybody. Thank you. So carry on message is quite simple. This one we should go for objective measurement of cortisol before taking an empirical decision. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a great pleasure to talk with you, everybody. Our expectations were more than fulfilled. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Thank for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amish Jain and Dr. Rahul Yadav for sharing your valuable insights on the topic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Now we'll have a short uh, validatory function. Before that, for the there is a lucky draw for those who stay on, and uh, uh, this uh, prize is sponsored by Jolie Healthcare. So their uh, uh, GM is brought. So let's uh, inv uh, invite our lead faculty to 
take the drop uh, professor peter you do, you can decide who is the winner of 10000 rupees next shot mm -hmm. Tension is rising. Dr. Pranushka. Now, Gonda. Anna. Pranusha. He is not there. Can take it. He is not lucky to be here. We may be some time. Right, Dr. Ranjit Kumar Gunpa. From Telangana. Oh, no. Dr. Uma Kosambe from Goa. From Goa. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Jake Harder. Hey, Anto. Dr. Anto Berdeen Bike. Chennai. <laughs> Dr. Raja Joy from Koshi. Dr. Rojo Joy, Kochi. Yes, you can, you can, you can receive on his back. Thank you, Professor Peter, for and thank you, Jolly Healthcare, for sponsoring this prize. Uh, can I request uh, our other guest faculty, uh, Rokshivani, to what is the price? Ten thousand. This is again ten thousand rupees. Uh, reimbursing the registration. Fine. No me. Army. Covid court. Army. Covid court. Unlucky. <laughs> okay. You can hand over that to the organizing committee. <laughs> Now uh, we will have the validity function. Our conference, which was launched in 2019, is coming to a close now. After fortunately having been indirectly responsible for the launch of the uh, Learn from the Legend series, because we had to postpone the conference, we had to launch. We launched this, and then that's why we were fortunate enough to have it. Uh, 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 legends uh, like Professor uh, Peter uh, Shivani, etc., uh, coming here, and uh, all this happening. So for this, we'll have a five-minute function for that. Uh, as guests, we would re request all both our guest faculty to come on to the dais, and I would request all the members of the organizing committee also to come on to a dais. Those who are present, please all the organizing committee members from all over the Kerala who are present, and of course our NNF Kerala president, Dr. Devi. Please come on to a dais. Require more chairs, and then others can sit. Please come. Please come. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, I would uh, request all of you, then we will have a group photograph after the short validity function. All the delegates who are caring to remain, come on to stage after the function for a group photograph. So, uh, yeah, please, please be around. For the photograph, please be around. Sit, 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 please. Please sit, please sit. Uh -huh. Please come, please come. All the faculty, please come. All the faculty. Any other faculty? Ah, oh, yeah, ma'am. I did not see. Please come. So, I, we would not, because this is, I mean, uh, we are actually uh, slightly ahead of time. We were supposed to have the validity function 445, but it's only 439. So, uh, in that way, it is better. So now I would request uh, our guest faculty. Uh, okay, Dr. Rahul Yadav, Dr. Anil Kurula, kindly come on the stage. So I will re request both our guest faculty, if, uh, Shivani from Paris and Professor Peter Davis from Australia, to speak a few words, concluding remarks, and then we'll. Go. I think it's all been it's all been said. This is what I love about India, the, 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 the friendliness and the chaos. But for a three-year conference, it, it's finally come to an end and it's been a very joyful experience. And on behalf of all of the speakers, I thank the organisers, and most of all, I thank the uh, the audience. It's been a very stimulating time for all of us. For your questions, both inside the hall and outside the hall, it's been wonderful getting to know you over these three three uh, three days. And uh, the last word must go to my friend Anoj. Congratulations! You've done a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you so much. One note from. Well, I would like to say a big thanks to Manoj. Uh, as you probably might know, I've been out of India for the last 20 years. It's my first conference back in India, and it has been such a pleasure, not only a very stimulating journey, um, talking to people, interacting with people, but also very emotional and very, very overwhelming. So I thank you very much for, for this lovely experience. One word from Dr. TV Devi. It had been a wonderful experience hosting this uh, great event, New York 2022, under the leadership of uh, none other than uh, Dr. V.C. Manoj, who is the backbone of this program. Of course, the NNF Trichur and the AP Trichur, NNF Kerala, they have put all their might into making it a reality, a dream come true. I think it has been an academic feast uh, appreciated by everybody. Uh, thank you once again for your presence and your wholehearted cooperation. Thank you. Okay, I would like to say that the uh, scientific con the, uh, conference was par excellence and all the, uh, you know, the hospitality all the arrangements were so well coordinated by right? such a you know big number and it was really a pleasure and i would really like to thank dr manoj and all the members of the organizing for this uh, wonderful uh, conference thank you so much thank you thank you anyone else would like to speak a few words no we will have photo with the delegates also or one like this okay fun like ah yeah Dr. Anil Kurula. Um, I'd like to thank the, the entire Kerala NNF for organizing this thing, this meeting. Uh, lots of scientific content after a long time and very active participation from everybody involved. Uh, meticulous arrangements and of course, uh, great enjoyment and food and festivity. Thank you for everything. Dr. Sridhar Sandaram. And Leslie Lewis.
I, I have come to threshold many times. Earlier it is two hundred, four hundred, six hundred. Now to the thousand plus magnitude. That shows the the capacity how the Manoj and his team can organize a conference over the years. And uh, very heart touching. Uh, the uh, hospitality is provided by this team. This we never get anywhere else. So I think that's the reason this conference is entirely different compared to the other conferences. Thank you, Manoj and team. Thanks. Not much that I can say that others haven't said, but uh, like I said, I mean, wonderful conference. And I think it's not an easy job to have a hybrid sort of a platform, you know, where you have virtual and interchangeably, I mean, you have a uh, thing also, and I think it went along very well. You all organized it very well. That again, I mean, we know Manoj organizes well. We just know Nelby was telling me that he's a fantastic organizer and the proof was there right in front of us. Thanks a lot. It was a very, very, very wonderful academic experience and we enjoyed it absolutely for two days. Thanks a lot to everybody involved. <laughs> Good conference. Best of luck. Thank you. So, uh, closing this ceremony, uh, we would request all the respected delegates who are sat, who are here with us. Uh, uh, thank. I would like to first of all thank all the delegates who had come from all over the country and our faculty who have come from all over the world to attend this conference. We had uh, more than 100 registrations from outside the country also, but they had all joined virtually. Most of them had joined virtually. So we are uh, thankful to all the delegates and faculty members, but for whose participation, this conference would not have been a success. So thank you all. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank my team, Team Kerala, who had been with me and our, uh, uh, us rather, I would say, uh, be, because it is, in, uh, all of you know, any conference is not a one man's job and it was just a commendable uh, uh, partnership because everybody decided what is best and then it just uh, happened. Uh, so I would like to thank the almighty uh, for making this happen. We had big, big challenges in the form of the pandemic. Uh, and then subsequently the uncertainty, the next challenge, we had to postpone it three times. Then the, like the threat of another one, even this conference was the threat of another wave happening. And then if it gets prolonged, then in Kerala, there is a threat of a flood also happening. So it was a uh, chain of threats, but somehow with God's grace, it happened and it happened uh, gracefully. So thank you all. Uh, so we'll have a great, yeah, uh, uh, fi yeah, final uh, official vote of thanks for, with the organization secretary, my dear friend, Krishna Mohan. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I thank all of you, all uh, our dear faculty members. Uh, we had 32 guest faculty as well, more than 100 uh, national faculty. Uh, and all our dear delegates uh, who made this uh, conference a success. And a, a special word of mention to our uh, event uh, management team, uh, so Sandeep and his team, and also uh, a, a word of uh, appreciation and thanks to our uh, to the uh, people from Medical College Trishur who were comparing the uh, function, uh, Jubilee Medical College for the last uh, three days. So uh, thank you all uh, uh, from my bottom of my heart. Thank you. Our compare team also, we had a uh, uh, in uninterrupted comparing by, I, I mean, I can't remember the names. Mary Ann and 
namita namita thank you thank you girls May I rise, uh, request everyone to kindly rise for the national anthem. It will end it. With